Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to episode 265 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. On July 1, 1790, Congress passed an act for establishing the temporary and permanent seat of the government of the United States. This act formalized a plan to move the capital of the United States from New York City to Philadelphia for a period of 10 years, and then from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., where the United States government would make its permanent home. Now, before the United States government could make its home in Washington, D.C., it needed infrastructure. It needed buildings to house the departments of government, roads so people could travel easily within the new city, and buildings to house new residents and new businesses. Essentially, Congress needed to build a city, which is why it created provisions in its act for establishing the temporary and permanent seat of the government, like, and be it enacted, as a president shall approve, the said commissioners or any two of them shall prior to the first Monday in December in the year 1800 provide suitable buildings for the accommodation of Congress and of the president and for the public offices of the government of the United States. Today, we're going to explore the suitable building Congress had built for the president. We're going to explore the early history of the White House, which stands as one of the most iconic buildings in the United States. Now, our guide through the early history of the White House is Lindsay Travinsky, the White House Historical Association's White House historian. And as we explore the early days of the White House, Lindsay reveals the history, work, and mission of the White House Historical Association why the White House stands where it does, and the history of the land it stands on, and details about the design and construction of the White House, including details about its furnishings and the workers who constructed it. But first, next week is Thanksgiving, which means it's that time of the year where we all get crazy busy with friends, family, and holiday activities. So before life gets crazy, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening and to wish you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for spending time with me each week, and for considering the ideas of our guest historians. I really enjoy your company, and I'm thankful I have a friend to share all this early American history with. Thank you for being there. And happy Thanksgiving. I wish you and your family a truly wonderful holiday. Okay, are you ready to take a detailed tour of the White House? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest works at the White House Historical Association as the White House historian. Her research expertise is in the politics, political culture, and government institutions of the early United States. She's the author of numerous articles, a monthly e-newsletter, and a new forthcoming book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Lindsay Travinsky. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you, Lindsay. And can I just say that White House historian is among the best job titles I've ever heard of? Yeah, it's pretty clear. It's really fun. And speaking of the fun, could you tell us a bit about the White House Historical Association and about your work as White House historian? Sure. So the White House Historical Association was founded in 1961 by First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. It is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and it was created to protect and preserve and share the history of the White House, the people that lived in it, the people that built it, the people that worked in it, and sort of the role of the White House as a symbol and an image in American history. What's really crazy is prior to First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy forming this organization, there wasn't any sort of organizational restrictions or legislation that protected what was in the White House. And there were some really incredible historic items when we think about all the different events that have taken place there. So each president could sort of decide what they wanted to keep or get rid of or put into storage or even have like a White House garage sale, which is nuts. 
as time went on, presidents were more and more aware of the history of the space and they tried to protect some of those items. But the organization was really put in place to help preserve those things. We have a couple of different institutional roles. The first is to help preserve the White House. So if you've had the privilege of touring the White House and you've seen the state floor, there are some really beautiful rooms there with great historic pieces. And we help make sure that those pieces stay in top-notch condition. So for example, recently, the Red Room, which is the famous Red Room, the walls are covered in red silk. And one of the panels was getting a lot of direct sunlight and had faded to be light pink. So we helped replace that. And so we cover the costs of making sure that that state floor really stays at museum level quality. We also help acquire objects to showcase the breadth of American history and all of the different American experiences. So if you get a chance to see the art in the state floor, there are beautiful paintings of all different types of American landscapes big historic moments, but then also artwork by all types of Americans. So we make sure there is art by African Americans and Asian Americans and every single type of experience you can possibly imagine. For example, in the Obama administration, we acquired a painting by Alma Thomas, and that was the first painting in the White House by an African American woman artist. So that was a big moment and pretty exciting. And then the last thing we do at the White House Historical Association is an education component. So we share the history of the space. And that's really where my role comes in. We talk about all of the stories of what has taken place there and the lives of the people that were there and worked there and in the nearby area as well. This is really interesting because the White House Historical Association is an association, not a museum. And yet it really performs a lot of the same roles that museums perform. It conveys the history of a place, it talks about the physical history of a building, and it really helps to preserve and maintain all the artifacts that are within and associated with that building. So the White House Historical Association has a really fascinating role. Yeah, I feel really lucky because I get the opportunity to do pretty much every type of public history activity one could imagine. So we learn about the history of objects and their provenance and the care and upkeep, which is sort of a traditional museum role, as you mentioned, get to teach to all sorts of different audiences, everything from elementary school children and D.C. charter schools to, you know, visiting dignitaries, anyone in between as well. So that's really fun. And then we also do original research and scholarship. So every day is different and we get to really do every type of public history activity that one could possibly imagine. Could you tell us about some of the research that you do in your role as White House historian? Absolutely. So we produce a lot of different content for a lot of different venues online and in print. So day to day, if press has a question about something, about something that's happened in the White House or a precedent, we will research and answer those questions or give an interview if they want to talk about it for a newspaper or a podcast or radio. We also do a daily Facebook post, which has a picture and then has a three to 400 word story. So anything from a Australian state dinner and one that was held during the Nixon presidency, because we recently had an Australian state dinner. And so we wanted people to know the history of that practice to a specific piece of China that was used to an African-American person who was actually photographed at the White House. And we think it was one of the first photographs of someone working on the grounds. So everything from material culture to diplomacy, we talk about for those posts. We also research and write longer articles for the website. And then we have specific research initiatives that we devote a lot of time and attention to. And the research initiative that has been our main focus right now is called Slavery in the President's Neighborhood. And that looks at the enslaved people that built the White House, that worked in the White House, and that lived in the broader neighborhood because it was a really interconnected community. And what's different about this project than some of the other ones that people may have seen at Monticello or Montpelier or Mount Vernon is that they're primarily looking at the enslaved community on the plantation, but not necessarily the people that were brought to the White House or to the president's house and their experiences away from that central place. So we really see this as filling a gap and we are relying on a lot of the great scholarship that's already been done, but also conducting a lot of original research and writing articles. And it will be 
all put into one really great new place. And that website should be launched around the first of the year. Well, that's exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Now, I wonder if we can make use of some of your great knowledge about the White House to investigate the early history of the White House. So in episode 222, Adam Costanzo took us through the early history of Washington, D.C. And during our conversation, Adam told us that the story of the nation's capital begins in 1790 with Congress's an act for establishing the temporary and permanent seat of the government of the United States. So, Lindsay, if the history of Washington, D.C., as we know it, begins in 1790, when does the history of the White House begin? That's a great question. So the land that the White House was on has a very long history, but we can talk about that in a bit. The White House itself starts almost immediately after Congress passed that legislation that you mentioned. As Adam described, Congress had determined that the Capitol would be somewhere on the Potomac, which was sort of the subject of the famous compromise between James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. But they left the specific location up to George Washington to determine, and he selected the southernmost point for a couple of good reasons. One, Georgetown and Alexandria were already established ports. And if you're going to build a new city, it makes sense to have a port that's already established and working so that you can have goods imported. So that's a really good business reason. He also wanted it to be closer to his home, which is maybe less of a good business reason, but understandable for personal reasons. And Washington worked with Andrew Ellicott, who was the official surveyor of the project, to survey the land and figure out where the government buildings were actually going to be located. So Washington had been trained as a surveyor. It was his first job. And he continued to sort of tinker with it on the side when he felt like it. So he really enjoyed the process of going through the land with Ellicott and figuring out where these buildings should be. And they selected the location where the White House was for two reasons. One, it was going to be on a little ridge and it was going to overlook Tiber Creek, which now runs underneath Constitution Avenue and no longer exists. But it was going to have a really lovely view. The second reason was that it was going to be separated from the Capitol. And that was great because Washington was really concerned that as Congress grew in size, congressional business was constantly going to be interrupting the clerks and the department secretaries that worked in the executive department. And so he wanted there to be distance so that there would be less interruptions. And so he'd be able to be a little bit more productive and future presidents wouldn't have to deal with that sort of constant complication. So once Washington and Ellicott selected that spot, then in 1792, construction actually began. There was a board of commissioners that were responsible for overseeing the process. And I know Adam talked a lot about Pierre L'Enfant's original vision and then sort of his calamitous end because he wasn't a very good politician and didn't work particularly well with others. So James Hoban became sort of the acting architect and construction actually began on the White House in 1792. It sounds like a lot of thought and care went into selecting the site that the White House now sits on. And what about the land that it sits on? You mentioned that The land has a history that predates Congress's 1790 Act to move the Capitol to the banks of the Potomac. And Stephanie would really like to know more about the land on which the White House sits. So could you tell us about the first people who owned and occupied the land and about this earlier history in general? Absolutely. So the land had a long history. Humans first began sort of living in this area about 10,000 years ago, and it was a largely nomadic existence. Sometime around 800 to 1000 CE, they introduced maize agriculture and sort of established more sedentary communities. And then we know that indigenous communities had built villages and communities along the Potomac and in this region. The Piscataway lived near here and the Nicostines, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think so. The Nicostines had a series of villages. In particular, they had one that was sort of on the corner tip between the Anacostia River and the Potomac River. So if you're looking at a map of Washington, D.C. today, you can see where they would have had that village. And it made sense because it was a good trade route because of the two rivers. So that really began to shift in about 1650 with the introduction of the tobacco trade in the area. As the communities in Virginia and Maryland expanded, they were increasingly looking for more and more land. And 
a lot of the Native Americans didn't produce tobacco. And so there was no reason for them to participate in that particular trade. And they were pushed farther and farther out. The Maryland Assembly signed a treaty. And I say treaty sort of in quotations because it's not clear what the Native representatives understood they were getting out of this arrangement. But it was the Article of Peace and Amity in 1666. And it established a Native reserve in the area, but it allowed the Maryland Assembly to continue to develop the land and required Native communities to return runaway slaves, which were very important to the growth of tobacco. So that really sort of was the last straw for local Native communities. And by 1670, all of the land that is in future Washington, D.C. was claimed by white colonists. So white colonists and white farmers continued to develop this land over the next 100 years. And when Washington and the commissioners decided that they were going to build upon this particular place, they came up with a plan to purchase land from local families. And they drew the grid of the cities. And then within each sort of grid square, they would divide the land between the farmer or the family that owned that land and the city. And the city would purchase their portion from the owner of the land. And then the family would freely give the land that was needed for roads and avenues. And most people in the area were really supportive of the concept of Washington, D.C. coming to their neighborhood. It made good financial sense for them, and they were excited about the economic opportunities. However, the person who owned the land upon which the White House sat was much less accommodating. He was very stubborn and difficult throughout all of the negotiations. And he wanted to make sure that he had negotiated as much money as possible for the land he was going to receive. And he continued to be a thorn in their side. Washington sent him a letter a couple of years later saying, can you please stop planting corn in Pennsylvania Avenue, which is sort of like the original cease and desist letter But he said, no one's using this road. I'm going to go ahead and continue to plant my crops. So his name was David Burns. He was particularly difficult, but he did eventually hand over the land and was paid for about 80 acres of his land. And depending on reports, it's a little bit confusing, but he had anywhere from 350 to 600 acres in sort of the Washington, D.C. area. Now, every building serves a purpose and a function. So What was the intended purpose and function of the White House, Lindsay? Why did the American people decide to build such a sizable house for their president? So the building was designed to really serve four purposes. So first, the president and his family and his staff, whether it be enslaved or free workers, they needed a place to live. And Washington and John Adams had lived in the president's house first in New York City and then in Philadelphia. And it had been a pretty cramped space. It wasn't designed for a president. And so they wanted a bigger space that could actually house the family and the private secretaries and the servants and the enslaved workers that would be needed in this sort of building. Then second, the White House had to be a place of day-to-day executive business. So Washington had established the precedent that he would meet and future presidents would meet with the cabinet and the department secretaries individually at the president's house. And that would really be his office. And so he and future presidents needed space to actually work and to have these meetings and to be able to meet with congressional leaders or visiting emissaries from foreign nations. And so there needed to be more space because Washington's private study in Philadelphia had been really quite small. It was only about 15 by 21 feet. And that didn't work when you had several people in a room. You needed more space. Then the third reason was hosting. So the president is responsible for conducting several sort of social occasions. Washington had hosted levees and Martha Washington had hosted drawing rooms and then they had state dinners. And occasionally they would also have open houses for New Year's or Fourth of July or for the president's birthday. And Adams had continued this tradition. When Jefferson moved into the White House, he changed that up, but each president continued to host social events, and sometimes thousands and thousands of people would attend, especially for inauguration celebrations. So they needed more space to be able to accommodate those enormous numbers, especially as the nation grew. 
And finally, they needed a symbolic space. So the Federalists especially were very concerned with presenting an image that would inspire respect and would inspire awe from citizens, but also from foreign nations. Keep in mind when, you know, we think of places of residence for kings or monarchs, we're talking about London and Paris, and Versailles cuts quite a fancy image. They didn't want anything maybe that grand, but they needed something that at least was going to be impressive and was going to demonstrate to people that the government was actually in control. And so they wanted to have big spaces that would be impressive and then also use traditional Greco-Roman architecture to sort of remind citizens of their Republican roots. And this is little r Republican roots and where they came from. Now, Marlene wonders about the construction of the president's house. Specifically, she'd like to know who constructed the president's house and what kinds of skills workers needed to have to work on this project. So there were a lot of people employed in Washington, D.C. as the building process was going. It's a little bit hard to give exact numbers because often the crews were moved back and forth from the Capitol to the White House or from the White House to the Capitol because both buildings were being created at the same time. And so depending on what supplies were available or which project the commissioners felt like needed more attention at any given moment, people were sort of shuffled back and forth. A couple of other factors sort of complicate this answer, which are that they kept decent records of who they paid for services, but they didn't keep one entire payroll. And they didn't necessarily always write down names. So it was pretty common at the time for construction sites like this one to hire out local enslaved people from families. And they would pay the owner instead of the enslaved person. And so it was a very good economic decision for the owner. Of course, the enslaved person then spent almost every day doing incredibly complicated labor. But because names aren't often written down of those enslaved people, we don't always necessarily know who they are or how many individuals were there. But I do have some numbers and I have a couple of different types of labor that were actually employed on the site. So there would have been just sort of basic laborers, hauling dirt, picking things up, doing sort of basic unskilled work. And we know at least 200 names of enslaved people that worked at this type of labor. And this is 200 for both the White House and the Capitol. And then plus another 46 owners who were paid for their enslaved people's labor. So this is sort of a bare minimum number. There could have been more. We know there were at least five free African-American laborers and at least 118 white laborers. Now, there were 10 overseers. So there would have then been people who were in charge of overseeing these crews of basic laborers. There were 23 sawyers. So those were people who were in charge of cutting wood, cutting down trees. Washington, D.C. at the time was a very wooded area. So they had to clear all of these lots for streets and for the White House. And it, it actually required a lot of skill to cut down these big trees and not hurt anybody. So you had skilled sawyers who were in charge of doing so. There were at least seven enslaved carpenters who were in charge of the more detailed woodwork. So in order to, for example, create, you needed to have kilns for the bricks in order to fire bricks. And you needed to have wood structures to sort of provide the overall shape of a wall. And that required more detailed woodwork. There were 106 free carpenters. There were 60 stone workers. And then there were 17 bricklayers. And then there were an additional several stone masons, which really did the more complex, detailed stonework that required laying the stones just so on top of each other to make sure that the wall would be sturdy and to do the fine carving. And most of those individuals were actually brought from Scotland because it's not that the United States didn't have skilled stonemasons, but they were primarily in places like Philadelphia and Boston and Charleston and they had good work there. And they didn't really want to go to D.C. because D.C. at the time was definitely not a destination. And so in order to actually get the sort of skilled labor to come to the area, they had to go to Scotland where they were having a little bit of an economic recession. And so it was a little bit easier to find people that wanted to do that work. 
I understand the historical records we have are limited in terms of what they reveal about the identities of construction workers. But Carol wonders if these historical records can reveal anything about the working and living conditions experienced by white and black and free and enslaved workers. So do the records speak to the working and living conditions of the White House's laborers? So what's really interesting is that it depended more on the type of skill set as opposed to race. So white laborers, just sort of the basic laborer, had a pretty similar existence to enslaved laborers. They probably actually lived together, if not in the same huts, at least next to each other. The commissioners set up a number of wooden huts in what is now Lafayette Square for the laborers to live in. And they either lived in sort of mixed race huts or at least within sort of the same area. They, in theory, received the same wages, although, of course, the enslaved people, those wages went to the owners. They received the same meals. There's some discrepancy in records. It seems like it's possible that the white laborers received certain alcohol provisions on top of the meals that maybe African-Americans did not receive. But then when we get into the more skilled laborers, that's where we really see the difference. And they would have perhaps slightly nicer accommodations. They would have higher wages. They would have more breaks. But for pretty much everyone involved, it was very difficult labor. It was literally backbreaking. You were working almost every day. Maybe you received a couple of holidays, depending on the commissioner's sort of feelings at the time. And it was what we would consider sort of be a swamp. It became very muddy because it was a construction site. So it was very dirty. It was definitely not fun by any stretch of the imagination, but it was at least good paid work if that was something that you really needed in order to survive. Now, according to Congress's 1790 Residency Act, the federal government had to relocate from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in 1800. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, we're going to have Lindsay tell us what it was like for John and Abigail Adams to become the first occupants of the president's house. Do you know what makes a sneaky good holiday gift? Super comfortable Bomba socks. Now, most people don't ask for socks, but that's just because they haven't worn Bomba socks. Personally, I'm a huge fan of Bomba socks. This time of year, I really enjoy wearing the merino wool socks because it's cold out and because these socks are made with super soft moisture wicking wool that help keep my feet comfortable and warm as I walk around town. Plus, I'm having a great deal of fun wearing the colors and themes Bombas created to celebrate Sesame Street's 50th anniversary. I mean, right now, I am wearing a colorful pair of Bombas socks that pay homage to Cookie Monster. You can't get much more fun than Cookie Monster. But aside from the fun and comfort I feel when I wear my Bombas socks, I really wear Bombas socks because Bombas supports a mission. Did you know that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters? Like many cities, Boston has a lot of homeless people. It also has some really great shelters to assist them. And Bombas helps both my homeless neighbors and the shelters that support them by donating socks. For every pair of Bombas socks you buy, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. So if you know a person that's completely impossible to shop for, or if you want to give a gift to someone that's really great and makes a difference, give them the gift of Bombas. Visit bombas.com slash bfworld and get 20% off during Bombas's big holiday sale between November 18 and December 5. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash bfworld to save 20%. Bombas.com slash BF World. In 1800, John and Abigail Adams moved into the president's house. Lindsay, what did these first occupants of the president's house make of their new home and office? What were their impressions of the place? So when John Adams arrived, he very much was arriving to a place that was not complete. And if anyone has seen the John Adams miniseries, that scene where he first arrived and people are still working on the grounds and the house isn't finished, that's pretty accurate. It's a pretty good depiction of what he saw when he first came. Abigail Adams wrote a letter to, I think, her sister saying that she was looking out the window and she was seeing a number of enslaved workers who were hauling dirt out of the yard across the street. And that really indicates to us that the 
grounds were very much still unfinished. It was still a construction site. Typically at the time when you put up plaster in a home, you would let it cure for about a year so that it would dry properly. They hadn't been able to do that because they had been behind schedule. And so they had fires going day and night to try and dry this plaster. The East Room, which is now sort of the grand reception hall at the White House and is very fancy, was unfinished. There was no wallpaper. There was no molding. So Abigail Adams famously used it to hang laundry because she didn't want to hang their clean laundry out in the backyard for everyone to see because there was no fence, of course. So anyone could pretty much just walk up to the White House. It was very cold because there were no window treatments and the fires were still sort of drafty and they hadn't quite figured out that insulation. The staircases to get to both the fancy formal staircase and the private back staircase were unfinished and sort of there was only a a little wooden one for people to get up and down the first and second floor. And the main entrance, which we now think of on the north side, was not used at the time. And so there was a little wooden staircase on the south side that they used as the entrance. So it was certainly not the White House that we think of today. Adams had two main complaints. He said there was no vegetable garden. So how are they supposed to feed themselves? So they did go about planting a vegetable garden pretty quickly. And there was no bell system. And so because there was no bell system in the home, they were going to have to have a lot more servants. And I say that intentionally because John Adams and Abigail Adams did actually have white servants in the White House. They were going to have to have more servants because they didn't want to have to yell around the house. And so he complained about it repeatedly. But he definitely did not have the glamorous White House experience that we tend to think of and never really did because he, of course, left a few months later after he lost the election. Yeah, it sounds like the president's house was barely livable, let alone a place where President Adams could conduct the business of government. I mean, it doesn't even sound like the White House was in a condition where the United States would want President Adams to host any foreign dignitaries there. Absolutely. There were only a couple of rooms that were actually in use. So the green room, or what is now called the green room on the state floor, was actually a bedroom. The red room was their family breakfast parlor. And what is now the state dining room and was actually Thomas Jefferson's private office, they used that was their only reception space. So they did host a couple of levees when they moved in, but it was really sort of unfinished and people were unimpressed by what they saw. Not to mention when they came, there weren't any roads for them to travel on. So they were all covered in mud by the time they had got there. So they mostly spent their time actually on the second floor in a couple of rooms in their basically their bedrooms and their dressing rooms because those were the warmest. They were on the second floor and it was winter. And so sort of heat rose to those spaces and they had good sunlight, but definitely wasn't a pleasant experience. And I think both of them, while John Adams was not happy to lose the election, they were not sad to leave the White House. So when did the White House become more functional and more like the grand building we know it as today? So Jefferson definitely had a lot of work done to the White House. James Hoban continued to do work for him to finish out the staircases. And he worked with Benjamin Latrobe to sort of redesign the entryways. His private office was actually finished and he furnished that primarily with furniture and art from home. And he purchased new maps for the walls. And then he displayed a lot of items that were sent back from the Lewis and Meriwether excursion out west in that space. So he certainly made the White House his in a way that was more finished than John Adams. It wasn't until Andrew Jackson's presidency that all of the rooms were actually completed. He was the first president to finish out the East Room as a proper reception space. And that was partly because when he was inaugurated, the house was so full with thousands and thousands of people that he actually escaped out the window to try and get away from all of them because it was so incredibly packed. So he realized that he was going to have these huge receptions and he needed a real space. And so he had the East Room completed, had wallpaper hung, had carpets installed, had furniture put into place and chandeliers so that the room would actually be functional. And obviously, the White House has gone through a lot of different revisions since then, but that was the first time all the rooms were finished. Furnished and finished rooms is definitely something that we think about when we think about the White House today. I mean, we think about all the different rooms, right? The blue room, the Lincoln bedroom, the Oval Office. And we also think about all the various artifacts and artwork that we might 
find in the White House, like John F. Kennedy's desk or all the presidential portraits. And Eric would like to know who was and who is in charge of furnishing and maintaining the White House. So, Lindsay, who furnished the White House during its earliest days? So in the early days, the presidents would receive a certain amount of money from Congress to complete any renovations or to make any repairs or to purchase any new goods. So China was constantly being chipped or broken. Carpets, when they were used all the time and had thousands of people on them, got worn down and were looking very threadbare. And so what the presidents would do, because this money was never actually sufficient to fill the home in the way that it ought to be filled, is they would sell off the old pieces that weren't in great condition or they didn't want to use anymore to sort of boost that budget. But each president and first lady were really in charge of designing the home however they wanted to. And so they could keep certain items if they felt that they had sentimental value. So for example, when Washington moved into his second New York presidential home, he purchased most of the furniture that was there from the Comte de Moustier, who had been the French minister to the United States. And he then brought a lot of that furniture to the Philadelphia president's house. And he purchased some additional items, both with the sort of official funds, but then also with his own funds. So the items that had been purchased with the official government funds, he then passed on to Adams. And Adams had some of them repaired and some new things purchased. And then he had all of those items brought to Washington, D.C., to the president's house, which is now the White House. So he left them for Jefferson. Now, by that time, thousands and thousands of people had used them, had sat in them, had walked on them, and they weren't in great condition. And so Jefferson decided to keep a couple of the things because he understood the symbolism of items that Washington had used. He didn't care much about the items that Adams had used, of course. But the items Washington had used, he understood that there was symbolism there. So he kept some of those, but not for useful reasons. And he needed to have all new furniture and sort of each presidency from that point forward did the same thing. They would keep some things, but they would buy a lot of new items or as much as they could afford to buy to try and keep up the standard of the place. And it was really up to them to determine what each room would look like, what the furniture taste would be. And so we see the rooms changing a lot depending on what person is in the White House. So for example, the famous sort of color rooms on the first floor, the green room didn't actually become the green room until the Monroe presidency. And the red room didn't become the red room until the Polk presidency. And the blue room didn't become the blue room until the Van Buren presidency. But even within those color schemes, they could shift a lot. So Van Buren initially had a much brighter blue concept on the walls than there is today. Today, there's a lot of blue furniture and there's blue draperies, but the wallpaper is actually primarily a light cream or sort of a light yellow with a few blue accents. And we actually, there's a presidential portrait of President Taft in that room. It's the only presidential portrait that was taken in the place that it currently hangs, which is a little fun fact. And it depicts really dark blue walls behind him. So even within the blue room, although there's a tradition of that space staying blue, it shifts all the time. Now, what about the War of 1812 and all the problems it must have posed for the White House and everything that was inside of it? Because the British did burn the White House in 1814. So Could you tell us about the burning of the White House and what it meant for the interior of the home? Absolutely. During the War of 1812 and 1814, the British burned the White House. And the only items really that survived were ones that Dolly Madison had ordered packed up and taken away. So there were a couple of enslaved men in the home, including the famous Paul Jennings. They were responsible for taking down the famous Washington portrait and a couple of other boxes of government papers and presidential papers. And then a few kitchen items, pots and pans had survived as well that they were able to dig out of the rubble. But other than that, everything was destroyed. And actually, the White House itself was in such bad condition that the walls were practically crumbling down and they kind of covered up the condition of the walls because they wanted to recreate the White House. And a lot of congressmen and politicians were angling to have the Capitol moved 
because they wanted it closer to their home. And if the White House is gone, then what's the point of actually keeping the Capitol in D.C.? So Madison and Monroe were kind of in cahoots to cover up the scope of the damage. And so really everything was destroyed. They had to start from scratch. So Madison never moved back into the White House. He moved into the Octagon House, which is nearby, and then into a different home that was more suitable for entertaining. And so President Monroe was the first one to move back in after the repairs. And Congress had given him $20,000 to purchase new furniture and new art and new wallpaper and carpets, which he actually exceeded by a, a pretty large margin. He purchased new furniture from largely from American merchants and American upholsterers, but also bought a lot from France as well. And so it was almost a whole scale project from scratch to redesign the White House. Now, as a follow up to the story of the burning of the White House, I heard a story that the president's house became the White House after its burning in 1814, that essentially laborers used a lot of whitewash to cover up the burn marks on the house and that from this whitewash is how the White House got its name. Is there any truth to that story? So the White House was actually white from the very beginning. In 1798, the construction builders applied a layer of lime-based whitewash to the outside of the stones. The stone is sort of a sandstone and it's pretty soft. And so the whitewash protects the stone from weather and heat and moisture. So the White House was white from the very beginning, but people didn't really start referring it to the White House until after the War of 1812, when it was again painted with this lime-based whitewash. And the name didn't become official until 1901, when Theodore Roosevelt sort of changed in his practices, instead of referring to it as the executive mansion or the president's house, officially started calling it the White House. Of all the colors Americans could have chosen to paint their presidential mansion with, why did they choose white? Why didn't they choose blue or green or brown or black or some other color? So colors were really, really expensive at the time. They didn't have dyes like we do. And so the pigment was really, really expensive. So the interior rooms were certainly painted. The wood, we have records of them painting certain wood pieces and moldings yellow and blue and red and green. And that was absolutely a sign of wealth and prestige. Only the most elite homes were able to afford to use that kind of paint color. But it would have been really unsuitable and it would have been really silly for the outside of the house just because it would have been so expensive to actually produce. And it had to constantly be reapplied because of dirt and weather and moisture. And so I don't think that Congress would have approved that sort of expense. We've talked a lot about the early history of the White House, and I wonder, is there something about the history of that place that people don't think to ask about, but would really find fascinating if they knew to ask you the right question? So unlike a lot of the other elite homes at the time, there weren't separate outbuildings from the White House. So there was a stable that was sort of far away, but there weren't servants' quarters or enslaved quarters behind the home because they thought it would be unseemly and it wouldn't create a nice image, which they were probably right about. So instead, the ground floor or the basement floor, there's actually a complete floor down there. And there was the kitchen, there was the laundry space, there was a room for the steward, who is the person that was in charge of sort of overseeing all of the other laborers and making sure the china was protected and making sure the expensive ingredients for the kitchen were locked up and the wine was locked up. And there were storage rooms, but it was very unhealthy. It was very wet. It was very damp because it was below ground. And D.C., is, if anyone's visited, it's a very wet place. There's a lot of rain, a lot of moisture in the ground. And so those spaces were constantly filled with moisture. And so therefore mold. They had constant rat issues and infestations of bugs. And so each new administration really tried to sort of rat out this issue, for lack of a better way to describe it. And they would clean out the basement and try and get rid of all the bugs and the rats and start from scratch, but kind of by the end, inevitably succumbed to the same issues. And so a lot of the enslaved people that lived down there or the servants that lived down there did have some health issues. And it certainly wasn't necessarily a great place to work or to live. But now when you go to see the White House, that has been created 
as part of the official visit. So the China Room is down there, the Vermeer Room is down there, the library is down there. And so when people go today, you don't see any of that history. You don't see any of the people that would have labored there or the history of that space because it has been so completely finished. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that that's what that looked like until Theodore Roosevelt was in office and actually completed a complete reconstruction of the basement and finished it properly. If so, for over 100 years, it would have been a really unfinished, kind of unpleasant place to live and to labor. Now, the mission of the White House Historical Association is to enhance understanding and appreciation of the executive mansion. Lindsay, why does the White House Historical Association have this mission? What can a better understanding of the history of the White House do for our understanding of early America? The White House is a really great opening for almost any type of history you could be interested in. So if you're interested in architecture or art or material culture, or landscapes, or natural history, or diplomacy, or race relations, or gender relations, or gender roles, or executive power, pretty much anything you could hope to study can be found in the White House. And because it was such an important symbol from almost the very beginning of the nation, and certainly was a very contentious symbol from the very beginning of the nation, it has always sort of served as a touchstone for different moments in American history. And there's no denying that the executive branch has played a huge role in major moments in diplomacy, as I mentioned, in race relations, in gender issues. So when we think of suffrage, or when we think of Japanese internment, or when we think of civil rights, the White House was a stage for many of these conversations and for pivotal moments. And so it's a great way to open the door into a lot of different types of American history. And it doesn't have to just be the stories of the first families because enslaved people and free African-American people and immigrants have all worked in the White House and actually made it run and be a functional space. And it's our perspective at the association that it's really the people's house. It's not actually the president's house. And so it belongs just as much to the people that worked there and lived there for many, many decades, and not just the first families. Now we should jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently, or if someone had acted differently. Lindsay, in your opinion, what might have happened if the British had not burned the president's house in 1814? How might the history of the White House and the federal government be different? Well, we certainly would have a lot more objects from that time period. It would be really great to be able to recover some of the things that were destroyed. And while not everything would have remained, certainly there would be more than there is today. We do have some items from the early history. So, for example, we have a really beautiful tea decanter from John Adams' presidency. But the reason we have that is because he took it with him and then it was acquired later on. So it would be really amazing and mind-boggling to think about all of the things that maybe would have survived that were destroyed. And certainly, of course, that goes for the Capitol, too. The original Library of Congress was destroyed when the Capitol was burned. So From a historian's perspective, it's a tragedy that all of those things are gone. But the history of the White House itself, actually, the remarkable thing is that it wouldn't have changed that much because Monroe and Madison understood already by 1814 the symbolism of the building and the role of the building in American history. And having that sort of lineage from the early presidents on was a really important touchstone for presidency and for the American people. And so that's why they were so committed to rebuilding the White House almost exactly as it was. The only thing they did differently was to add the two porticos on the front, on the north and the south side. Monroe had those added. But other than that, they built the White House exactly the same. And they did so because they understood it was already so important. And so that's the amazing thing about this moment is I don't actually think it would have shifted White House history that much. 
or even presidential history, other than maybe we would have some more records and some more archives of what had been there. So, Lindsay, does the White House Historical Association have any events or exhibitions coming up that we should be aware of? Sure. So we have a quarterly public lecture series that's free and open to the public. Unfortunately, our last lecture for this year was in October, but we have a great lineup getting ready for next year. The first event is going to be on February 15th, and the new secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, will be speaking with David Rubenstein. He will be interviewing Lonnie Bunch. So that will be a really amazing event. So be sure to sign up for that if you're interested in attending. It's probably going to be a full house and sell out pretty quickly. We'll have additional lectures that we will announce. And then next fall, in fall of 2020, we will be hosting the Presidential Site Summit in Dallas this year. It will be in September of 2020. And it is a gathering of history sites, presidential libraries, museums, and really anyone interested in presidential history to convene and share best practices and network and talk about how we can continue to promote the history of these spaces and share them more broadly and how we can do so more effectively. So that will be open to the public as well. So tickets aren't yet for sale for that, but keep it definitely on your radar. What about a White House tour? Can we tour the White House? And if we can, do you have any tips, tricks or recommendations to help us make the most out of our tour? The White House is available for tours. It is available for tours usually four days a week, Tuesday through Friday in the mornings. The best way to go about getting a tour is actually to reach out to your local congressperson. So ask them to set something up. They will be able to do so. You can just call their office. And my best tip is actually to download. We have an app called the White House Experience because these tours are all self-led. So You won't have anyone going through the rooms with you telling you what to look at or what certain art pieces are. So this app sort of does that for you. And you can go room by room and see what is in the space and what's the history of the space, when it was added, when it was modified. You can do so anyway on the app, even if you're not there, but it might have a little bit more impact and more meaning if you're actually in the space. It's a free app. And we also do seasonal tours on the app. So for Thanksgiving, we'll do sort of special segments to talk about different practices in previous administrations. In the fall, when there's a garden tour, we usually have a garden tour app, a special app available. And you can see, you know, different spots who added certain trees, who added the pool and the children's garden and different history in that way. So definitely check that out. It will make your tour a little bit more engaging. And before we go, you have a new book coming out next spring in 2020. It's called The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. Could you tell us a bit about your forthcoming book? Yeah, thanks for asking. The book will be out on April 7th, 2020. It is about the creation of the president's cabinet in Washington's administration. The cabinet is not in the Constitution, and no legislation ever created it. So the book explores where it came from, how Washington created it, what practices he included as he dealt with the huge personalities of Hamilton and Jefferson and Knox in his administration, and then what precedents he left for presidents that came after him, because every president has had a cabinet, despite the fact that it's nowhere in the Constitution. And so it really explores this practice. And remarkably, it is the first book on the cabinet since 1912. So I feel very fortunate to have captured that moment and to be able to answer this question. And I'm really excited to be able to share it with readers. It's been a long time coming. And one last question. If we have more questions about the history of the White House or the White House Historical Association, how can we get in contact with you? So you are free to go to our website, which is whha.org. We have a bunch of information about the history of the White House. If you want to get in touch with me, you are, of course, welcome to do that as well. The best place to do that would be to visit my website, which is lindsaychervinsky.com. Or you can find me on Twitter. I'm very active there. And my handle is lmchervinsky. Lindsay Chervinsky, thank you for taking us through the White House and its early history. Thank you for having me. This was great fun. As a stage for many pivotal conversations and events, and as the seat of the United States' executive branch, the White House 
provides us with a wonderful window to view the history of the United States. Now, through the history of the White House, we can explore nearly every type of history. Art history, architectural history, natural history, political history, social history, the history of objects, the history of labor, and this is a versatility we could see throughout our conversation. For example, in terms of its architectural history, we know that the White House was built to serve four needs. To house the president and his family, to serve as a place where the executive branch could conduct its day-to-day business, to host and entertain dignitaries and members of government, and to serve as a symbol of the Republican roots of the nation. Plus, we also explored the social and labor dynamics of the White House's construction. We know that there were at least five free African-American laborers and 118 white laborers. We also know that there were at least 10 overseers, 23 sawyers, seven enslaved carpenters, 106 free carpenters, 60 stoneworkers, and 17 bricklayers, all of whom worked together on both the White House and the Capitol, and all of whom lived together. But just because all the workers lived together and worked together doesn't mean they were treated equally. As Lindsay told us, skilled laborers received more money, more breaks, and better living conditions than unskilled laborers. We also know that white and free laborers received their wages, while enslaved laborers were forced to give up their wages to the people who owned them. There's really a lot of social, labor, cultural, and economic history contained in just this broad overview of who built the White House. And it's really just a glimpse of the many histories that we can explore when we explore the history of the White House. Now, one aspect of the early history of the White House that I keep coming back to is the goal the American people had that their executive mansion would inspire respect and awe in citizens and in foreign nations. Does the White House accomplish this goal? So why am I thinking about this? Well, before Lindsay and I sat for this interview, Lindsay gave me a tour of the White House. It was a really great tour, and we saw all the rooms she mentioned. The blue room, the green room, the red room, and the library. But what was really neat for me about this tour was that just two weeks earlier, I had toured Versailles for the first time. Now, how to describe Versailles to you? Well, I'm not actually sure I can describe it, except to say it is really big, really grand, and totally a place you need to see in person if you get the opportunity. It's really not a place that you can capture in just one photograph or in many photographs. You just have to see it. Plus, the thing about Versailles is we tour this place today, and it is amazing and awe-inspiring. And yet, It doesn't have any of the fine artwork, wall coverings, or any of the furniture that the palace would have had before the French Revolution. The French revolutionaries sold off all the grandeur of Versailles to help pay for the revolution. So I was thinking a lot about Versailles as I toured the White House. And I was also thinking about the Palace of Westminster, where British Parliament sits. Several years ago, Tim and I had the opportunity to tour Westminster, which, much like Versailles, is a sprawling seat of government. Its sheer size combined with its ornate stonework and wood carvings, its really tall ceilings, that is a building that inspires awe. But it's a different kind of awe from Versailles. Which brings us back to the White House. The White House is a very different type of building than the ones in France and London. It's smaller, it's plainer, it doesn't sprawl. It's really a building that you could capture in a single photograph. And yet, I really do think that it fulfills the mission early Americans had for it to inspire awe in its citizens and foreign nations. It's just a very different type of awe than those buildings in France and London. Anyway, I think this makes for an interesting comparison and something to think about, because the White House, Westminster, and Versailles may be very different types of buildings, but they've all served as powerful seats of government and imperial power, and they all inspire awe in very different ways. And I think that's where I'm going to leave this conversation. How and why do the buildings of government inspire awe? And why do governments need to inspire awe with their architecture? No answers, just questions, which I really hope you enjoy thinking about. Look for more information about the White House Historical Association, Lindsay, and her forthcoming book, The Cabinet, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 265. If you're looking to give gifts that are fun, comfortable, and useful this holiday season, gift the gift to Bombas. For every pair of Bombas socks you buy, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. Plus, when you visit bombas.com slash bfworld, you can save 20%. That's bombas.com slash bfworld. Production assistance for this podcast 
comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, so what did you think about my questions? How and why do the buildings of government inspire awe? And why do governments need to inspire awe with their architecture? I'd love to hear what you think, so please send me your answers. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.